If you'll take your scripture passage out of your uh, bulletin, and, and we're going to systematically read through this as part of the message today. Um, this scripture has an anointing of God on it. I, I don't know, uh, I think all scripture does, but boy, as I've been studying this last week, this scripture, uh, this anointing of God in, it is endeavoring to take us to a place beyond words. You know, a sense of the presence of God that is a place beyond words. And so we need words because we're human beings and we're not totally uh, able to hear people speak silently to us. We all have a little telepathy, but we're not totally uh, able to have telepathy to understand about God. But as you study the scriptures and as you restudy them and as you restudy them, they'll have an anointing on them that'll take you to a place beyond words. And that's where the richness of a faith in God is, is this place beyond words, deep in our souls. Would you read the first uh, three lines with me? God, God, I am running to you for dear life. The chase is wild. If they catch me, I am finished. Ripped to shreds by foes, fierce as lions, dragged into the forest, and left unlooked for, unremembered. You know, we have times in our lives, every one of us, when we're, we're running and we're trying to get in touch with God. And uh, the psalmist here in Psalm 7, the psalmist of this psalm is David, David was constantly running for his life. King Saul was, had assassination attempts on him repeatedly all throughout Israel, throughout the Negev desert, throughout the wilderness. He was constantly trying to kill David. And David was constantly running to God for dear life. And the chase is wild. And there's a lot of things chasing us, chasing you and me too. There's, there's fear of terrorism, there's fear of financial instability, there's fear of losing our health, fear for our children, for our moms and dads, uh, our concerns for spouses. Uh, there's a lot of things that we need to run to God for dear life every single day. And the chase gets pretty wild sometimes. One of the reasons we come to church is just to calm down a little bit, to, to realize that God is always with us. And yet, if you really want God in your life, you have to have a certain intensity, a certain real desire to have God guide you and, and, and be truly with you. And you know, I, I read this, uh, I've been reading this book for months, and I'm rereading it and rereading it, and there's a story in the book. It's, it's uh, I have a tendency to, to live to eat rather than to eat to live. And so I'm reading this book, which is, I'm trying to change the way I think. And the guy tells a story about his cat in the book. He couldn't get his cat to lose weight. We have that problem in our house, by the way. <laughs> he just could not get his cat to lose weight. And he tried all these different diets and stuff and everything. And the cat would torment the dog, the big neighbor dog next door. Just, if you've ever seen a cat torment a dog, it's, it's bad. <laughs> It's cruel, you know, and this cat tormented a dog. Well, one day, and the, the author of the book wasn't really sure whether it was on purpose or not, but the dog got out. He said there's a real likelihood that the neighbor just got tired of hearing his dog bark and howl and just let the dog out. Well, the dog went after the cat. Imagine that. <laughs> and the guy who wrote the book said, I have never seen my cat run so fast in all his life, and the dog was right on him, you know. Well, it was several hours before the cat came back, and the cat was walking with a limp, so the dog got at it a little bit, you know. And he said what happened was the cat's entire uh, system changed, and the cat got lean. And no matter how much food he fed him, the cat stayed lean. And his, his postulation is the cat's body began to burn fat 
because there's a chance that the neighbor was going to let that dog out again. And he said, so when you exercise, and I do this down at Netawaka Gym at the Hornet's Nest, when you exercise, the last bit of your exercise, just go as fast as you possibly can and pretend that something is chasing you. You know, the, which leads to an old joke, uh, and I think we should have fun in church. You know, if you're camping in the woods and a bear drives you out of your, your tent, run as fast as you can. You don't have to be the fastest person in the world. You just have to be faster than the other guy in the tent. <laughs> but what happens when you exercise like this is that your body will think something is chasing it and it will burn calories faster and uh, you'll have a tendency to lose weight. So I've been, there's one machine over there, actually two, where I walk and the last five minutes of this one, I'm just going crazy, you know. I can't, with four knee surgeries, I gotta take it easy, you know. But for an old man, I'm going crazy. And, and I'm trying to, to do this. Well, life has a way of making you crazy, you know. Things are, sometimes uh, your friends will abandon you uh, emotionally, you know. Uh, sometimes you don't even know why. Uh, you'll get in trouble at work. It's not your fault, you know. And you feel like if they catch me, I'm finished. I'm going to be ripped to shreds. Fierce as lions, dragged into the forest, left unlooked for and unremembered. Now, I've t I mentioned this before, but I think it's a really interesting thing. There were African lions in the Jordan River Valley when David was watching sheep. There were bears in those mountains, and there were African lions. They killed the last African lion in the Jordan River Valley in 1914. So clear into the 20th century, there were African lions. So when David came to Goliath and he said, I've killed bears to keep them away from the sheep, and I've killed lions, he was talking about genuine African lions and genuine bears. And David knew what happens when a lion kills something. It drags it into the forest and eats it. And we don't want, none of us want to be remembered, you know. Uh, but we all want to be remembered. We don't want to be unremembered. So uh, running to God for dear life is really a foundational thing in the Christian life. It's very, very important. Would you read with me the next four lines? God, if I've done what they say, betray my friends. If my hands are really that dirty, let them get me. Walk all over me. Leave me flat on my face in the dirt. Stand up, God. Pit your holy fury against my furious enemies. Wake up, God. We'll stop there. Boy, that's pretty arrogant, isn't it? You're telling God to stand up? Wake up. Are you asleep? I've been praying about this for a long time. I've been asking you. Stand up, God. Wake up. It's okay to get angry with God. It's okay to get impatient. Uh, we all have enemies. Somet I've been surprised sometimes at where my enemies come from. Really surprised. Uh, I've had them in my own family. My aunt became my enemy. Uh, fortunately, it wasn't long-lasting, but there it was, you know, right straight in front of me. And uh, enemies are actually good for you. Dogs chasing that cat are good for cats. <laughs> enemies are really good for you. You know why? They make you pray. This is going to sound terrible. 9-11 was really good for this country. Boy, I'll tell you what. When everything is totally gone, you immediately go to God. And, and the, the, the depression in our country increased after 9-11, and a faith in God increased. We had some enemies out there. And of course, we still do. And I'll tell you, enemies make you on your toes. I'm, I'm actually grateful for all, every single enemy I've ever had. Enemies will tell you the bad stuff about you that your friends won't. And enemies will, you know, if they're really cruel kind of people, they'll do everything they can and to, to harm you. And uh, people will come in my clinic and say, they said this about me, and they tried to get me fired, and they did that, and they did. And you know, what I always say is, just do the next right thing. Be, continue to be loving. Pray for that person that's doing that. You don't have to like them, but you do have to love them. And so pray for them. And, hmm? 
Right. Yeah, never pray for, never pray for patience either. Don't, don't do that. But uh, enemies are good for you in the long run. They, they make you spiritually fit. And uh, it's okay to get angry at God. Uh, we've all been angry at our parents, and our parents still loved us, if, if they were good parents. And, and we've all been angry at God, and, you know, anger is a real connection to God. It's, it's almost as strong as love. In some ways, it is as strong as love. Anger is the backside of love. The opposite of love is not anger. The opposite of love is apathy. And David loved God, or he wouldn't be saying, stand up, wake up. Uh, and, and David really uh, had that kind of relationship with God. Let's, let's read, start with my, our, my accusers are in the courtroom, and then we'll finish with the last line, close the book on evil. My accusers have packed the courtroom. It is judgment time. Take your place on the bench. Reach for your gavel. Throw out the false charges against me. I'm ready, confident for your verdict, innocent. Close the book on evil, God, but publish your mandate for us. Now, the devil is called the accuser of the brothers and sisters. The devil, according to the book of, of Job, and really according to the Hebrew scriptures and the Christian scriptures, is constantly before the throne of God, say, look at Michael, look what he's doing. And he's your son? Or look at Susan. Look what she did. She's supposed to be a follower of you, and look what she did. And, and our enemies will do that. They'll accuse us. And they'll, they'll take us to court. The, court of, the, the worst court of all, which is the court of God. And, and they get furious, you know. And... God is our judge, and when God looks down on us, he looks at us, if we confess our sin, he looks at us as covered by the blood and forgiveness of Jesus on the cross. I've been reading a lot of scriptures lately that talk about angels shining and talk about the face of Moses shining, talk about the face and clothing of Jesus shining on the Mount of Transfiguration. And when you and I are covered by the blood of Jesus, which we celebrate every Sunday in communion, we're shining in God's face. In God's eyes, you and I are clean, not because we're clean, but because we want to be clean. And every day we ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and every day we ask to be covered by the blood of Christ. So when our accusers in our human life come to us, we may not be perfect, but we're children of God. And we can ask for God's protection. And when our accusers in the spiritual realm, which are demons and Satan, come before God, we're covered by the blood of Jesus. So they're false charges, essentially. They're false charges. We're innocent through Jesus' blood. The trouble with living a human being life, we're an eternal spirit with a physical body, is that we not only struggle from evil outside of us, we struggle from evil inside of us. And it's, uh, we got enemies in the front of us and we got enemies in the back of us. And so that's why I always encourage you to have morning devotions every day because it keeps your eyes alert. You know, that cat better not be asleep when that dog gets out, you know. It, it keeps you alert. And so you can see the enemies within yourself and combat them, and you can see the external uh, evil forces around you and combat them. So you are innocent in the blood of Christ. Jesus will close the book on evil and set us free. Let's read the next passage. You get ready for life, and then it ends with, His nerves are sandpapered raw. You get us ready for life. You probe for our soft spots. You knock off our rough edges. And I am feeling so fit, so safe, made right, kept right. God in solemn armor does things right. But his nerves are sandpapered raw. Nobody gets by with anything. This is what faith in God does. 
from a mental health standpoint, from a spiritual standpoint, from an intellectual standpoint, from a psychological standpoint, faith in God gets us ready for life. Many of our friends who don't have a living faith in God, they're existing, but they're really not ready for life. And it makes us ready for life, and the Holy Spirit is constantly probing our soft spots. When we would have uh, military exercises, we would have enemy forces come in. Uh, we call the, the opposition forces. And sometimes on these field training exercises, all night long, they'd be probing our defense perimeters. And they, they would figure out where our machine guns were. And they'd, they'd see if they could sneak in between the machine guns. They were constantly probing us. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit will bring things to your mind that you need to work on. The gentle Holy Spirit will gently be probing you, telling you, you know, it might be wise not to do that. Or, why don't you go do this good thing for this other person? The Holy Spirit's probing us, just like you probe your kids. You have to use utensils at the table. <laughs> this is not optional, you know. Uh, you need to treat your sister better. You need to treat your brother better. The Holy Spirit is constantly probing us like that with our best interests in mind. God knocks off our rough edges. If you have a real good friend, they're going to tell you if you've got halitosis. Real good friends will do that. They'll knock your rough edges off. You'll brush your teeth more and take mouth mints. And you know what happens when all these things, when God prepares us ready for life, he probes our soft spots, he knocks off our red edges, we feel so fit, we feel so safe, we realize that we're made right, that we're kept right, and that God is doing right things with us. But you know, when, when things are not going well, God's nerves are sandpapered raw. And when somebody continually, willfully does things against the uh, counsel of God, they don't get by with anything. Sin does, does bother God, and sin uh, bothers God, but God is very long-suffering, but it'll reach a certain point. And this is true in the legal system, too. It'll reach a certain point where you've had so many minor charges that after a while those minor charges become felonies and things get really tough. Uh, every world religion teaches what goes around comes around and, and that's how it is with God. And so our enemies aren't going to get by with, with treating us badly. Most of the time I've noticed when enemies treat me badly for nothing that I've really done that's bad, I just sit and watch. I almost want to get away from him uh, because I know something bad is going to happen to him, and it, it does every time. Every time I've had people treat me badly, I don't want to be in their shoes. And what this does, it takes us to this next three lines, the last three lines, will you read those with me too? God is already in action. I am thanking God who makes things right. I am singing the fame of a heaven-high God. Even before you pray, God knows you're going to pray, and things will be got into action for your good. God is going to be acting for your good. God is going to be making things right in your life. You are not a mistake. God is making you right, and God is making the things in your life right. And when we realize these things, then we can really sing these praise hymns that John puts on the front. I am thanking God who makes things right. I am singing the praise, the fame of a heaven high God. I attended a workshop Friday all morning long in Kansas City with a friend. And we talked about a lot of trauma, a lot of mental health disorders, a lot of pain. And what was really fascinating to me, this wasn't a spiritual workshop at all. It was just uh, for therapists and counselors. But at the end, they said, you know, 
the solution to a lot of this stuff is when you really deal with your pain, you see that your pain can reach out and help other people because they will sense that you've been through that pain and you'll experience joy and gratitude for all the painful things that have happened in your life. That's the bottom line of the Christian life too, isn't it? Joy and gratitude. I can praise God no matter what. I can have joy and gratitude because I know God is making things right. He's already in action in my life. You know, the storms of your life can push you to God. Uh, I used to work at Lake Kachuma, and on our breaks, they'd let us take rental boats out on the lake. And I loved to get out on the lake in storms. I was the only one of the guys that worked at the boat dock that surfed, you know. But I get a 12-foot aluminum boat and a three-horsepower uh, Johnson engine, you could spin those things 360 degrees. And I'd, I'd get out when the waves were really big, i get out and, and you, it's sort of hard to get into them, you know, but then I'd turn and I'd surf them like a surfboard, you know. And you had to be careful you flip the boat, you know. That's against the rules. <laughs> but you can do that with the, the problems in your life. You can surf them. You can thank God for them. You can say, God, you know, I know this is difficult, but I know you're making things right. I know you're on my side. I know you're already in action. And, and you can surf through death. You can surf through pain. You can surf through surgery. Uh, you've been doing a lot of surfing lately, Rick, you know, a lot of surfing. I'm glad, I'm glad that storm is knocking down a little bit because you've been doing way too much surfing. But joy and gratitude come if we let the storms of life pushes. Do you see how this scripture is an anointed scripture? There's just tremendous wisdom and anointing in these psalms. Just tremendous power. God is making things right in your life. You aren't alone in your struggles. You are not alone. And you never will be alone. Even after your body dies, you're never going to be alone. Let us sing our hymn of an invitation, Oh, How I Love Jesus. Thank you. 